started. So hello and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining. Uh, my name is Jessica Mulcahy and I am a health educator for Community Health at Atlantic Health System. Tonight's webinar, Caregiver Health Finding Balance, is presented by Rebecca Abenante, who is our Healthy Aging Program Coordinator over Atlantic Health System. Before we begin, I have a few announcements. This webinar is being recorded and will be shared in its entirety on our website. All participants are muted. If you have a question, please use the Q&A button and use the chat feature for any comments. We will try to get through all questions at the end of the presentation. And Atlantic Health would like to remind you to take care of your health. Be sure to go for your annual screenings and doctor appointments. For more information, please visit atlantichealth.org slash your health. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to you, Rebecca. Wonderful. Thank you very much. It's nice to be with all of you this evening, and I appreciate um, and applaud you for taking a little bit of time out of your day to take some time for yourself to be able to learn a little bit more about how you can take some better care of yourself as a caregiver. So as Jessica mentioned, my name is Rebecca Abenanti, and I'm hoping that you can be seeing my slides now, correct? Wonderful. The magic of technology. When it all works, it's great. So with that, um, so as Jessica mentioned, my name is Rebecca Abenanti. I coordinate the Healthy Aging Program at Atlantic Health, and I'm involved with a number of the geriatric initiatives um, at Atlantic Health System and at Morristown Medical Center specifically. Um, while this program is, is very aging focused in some context, um, there's also things that are applicable if you happen to be caring for someone else in your life, um, another adult in your life, someone with disabilities or other mental health concerns that might give you some good sense of things of how you can take some good care of yourself along this journey as well. So I always like to start with this particular graphic and it's, you see this heart and in the middle of the heart is sort of the, one of the predominant words, you see the word caregiver, but you see lots of other roles and relationships that many of us have in our life um, that really can, dictate the kind of relationships of the people we might be caring for, but oftentimes we might fill some of these roles for um, the people in our life ourselves. So one of the things that we talk about is how do we find the balance between our role as a caregiver and the other roles that we have in our life. Um, I'm a social worker by background. I specialized in working with older adults and their families. And oftentimes this is the conversation that I have with individuals is about trying to find this balance because, you know, there's 24 hours in a day. Oftentimes our caregiving responsibilities um, consume a lot of that time during our day, especially if the higher or more that our loved one needs assistance from us. And so how do we make that time to be able to find that time for ourselves, but also the time to be able to nurture the other relationships in our life as well? So for those of you who may be starting out on this journey um, and, you know, thinking about the understanding of your role as a caregiver, the reality is most of us take on this role at some type, some point in our life. Um, it's really anybody who provides support to someone else on a regular basis is a caregiver. This could be an older person, someone with disabilities, an adult or a child, someone with mental health concerns, someone living with chronic illnesses, or really anybody else that we feel needs some type of assistance. Um, many of us, especially women, belong to what we call the sandwich generation. Um, we're caring for um, aging parents or aging loved ones, maybe a spouse or a partner, as well as maybe children or what I call the boomerang children, the young adults that kind of didn't quite leave for college or after college or le left for college and came back um, and find ourselves kind of in that sandwich between multiple generations and providing that support. You know, there's about 30% of our population and a growing number of people in our country provide care for someone who's chronically ill, um, disabled, or older. And over 15 million people care for someone who has Alzheimer's disease or another type of dementia. 
And as we talk about this role and how impactful it is in our day to day, um, there's a great quote that I love from um, one of our former first ladies, Ms. Rosalind Carter, who's, who's been a really big champion for caregivers and actually founded a lot of the national initiatives around caregiving. Um, so there's four kinds of people in the world. Those who have been caregivers, those who currently are caregivers, those who will be caregivers, and those who will need caregivers, right? Caregiving is oftentimes what I like to call a journey. Um, you know, everybody's experience is a little bit different. Um, as we're on this road, there may be some similar scenery, um, depending upon who we are caring for and the types of issues that they may have. Um, so for example, if we are caring for someone with a memory uh, issue. There may be some similarities to other caregivers in some of the symptoms that our loved one might be experiencing, and that road might look a little bit similar, but we are all unique individuals, and we all have unique perspectives, and the individuals we are caring for are um, folks who've had a long life of different experiences and unique experiences, and so sometimes that scenery looks a little bit different along this caregiver's journey. Um, caring for someone who loves that, who we love can be both a challenging and a rewarding experience, sometimes at the same time. Um, it doesn't mean that it, that, you know, it comes without challenge. Um, it doesn't mean that we don't want to care for our loved one. It just means that sometimes it's hard, right? Because on any given day that we wear lots of different hats, and I say this as a professional who's worked with family caregivers for a long time, but I've also been a family caregiver myself. Um, and, you know, depending upon what our loved one needs, we wear lots of hats. Maybe we are helping with medical care. Maybe we are helping to arrange medications. Maybe we are being a good advocate, uh, helping with household tasks, chores, grocery shopping, giving someone a ride, um, you know, to provide providing hands-on care. Whatever our loved one needs, that's the hat we wear oftentimes. And I often say that caregiving is, is not a one-size-fits-all. Elder care is not a one-size-fits-all. It often requires that we have to figure out not only what works best for our loved one regarding their preferences, their needs, and their finances, but also what works well for us as a caregiver as well. So, just like I said, this is a journey, there's a spectrum, right? And oftentimes this caregiving spectrum starts with occasional assistance. Maybe our loved one needs a ride to the doctor, we go grocery shopping, whatever they might need. But as the needs increase, more routine or daily assistance is often what is, becomes required. Things like helping with personal care or helping manage finances. Maybe that's hiring or engaging supportive services like home care or home delivered meals. If our loved one moves out of the home that they have lived in or out of the home that they are living in with us and moving into a care setting such as assisted living or a skilled nursing facility, that doesn't mean that our caregiving role stops. It changes, but it doesn't stop. It often now means that we are responsible for collaborating with the care team at the facility, the physicians, the nurses, the medical team to make sure that our loved one's needs are being met as well as Oftentimes, one of the other important pieces is managing the finances and helping to make sure the bills get paid. You know, as I said before, we wear lots of different hats and activities can range from anything that our loved one might need, whether helping with personal care, um, managing a household, emotional support is oftentimes one of the big things that we do as well as caregivers um, in those check-in phone calls and, you know, providing those that moment of support and when our loved one needs it, that moment of reassurance and encouragement, um, coordinating care. I'm not sure if I have any, any doctors on the line here, but if you do, I hope you'll forgive me that sometimes it's hard to get you know, two, two or more doctors on the same page, two providers on the same page to really make sure everybody's working together. And that takes a little bit of advocacy. Um, as well as managing medications, managing personal care, right? So all of the things that our loved one might need for us from us. So oftentimes this means that as an older adult, that you know, oftentimes older adults engage support from their built-in support system. That is oftentimes our spouses, our siblings, our children, neighbors, friends, right? This is you know, sort of natural. Um, you know, one of the, I, I, when I had the opportunity to do this talk last time in person, which I know has been a little bit 
couple of years now. Um, but I, you know, I asked the question of the group in the event that something happened and you needed help on your way home, you got a flat tire, who would you call? And I had someone in the group that said, I'd call AAA. And I said, AAA is great, right? But, you know, it, outside of AAA, right? Is there anyone else that we would call? And oftentimes it's a family member or a friend um, because this is sort of our built-in support system. But our support system deserves to have open and honest conversations with one another so that we can better understand everybody's preferences and mutual expectations. You know, um, for the older adult, is their expectation of what their adult children can do for them realistic? Right? Um, is the services that we want to engage something that, you know, as a caregiver, that we think that our loved one can benefit from? more assistance, such as maybe um, home care. Is that affordable, right? Are the mutual expectations realistic? Is it safe? Is it manageable? You know, um, I had a caregiver that said to me, you know, that when we were talking a lot about her role and what she was doing for caring for her parents, um, it was a lot, you know, and going and going to their home every day, twice a day, setting up breakfast, making sure they were okay for the day, you know, then she would go to work full-time job then go to her parents' house in the evening um, and then and help them set up for dinner, get ready for bed, help with any personal care, clean up the house a little bit. And then she would go home to her husband and her, you know, teen young adult children. Um, and, you know, the, all of this involved, you know, a f half an hour, 45 minute plus commute every way she went. And, you know, we talked a lot about the sustainability of that, you know, um, it's wonderful that I think sometimes as caregivers that we want to be able to do so many things, but, you know, we will talk a little bit tonight about how we also have to make sure that our own cup remains full, that we have something to give from. Um, and, you know, we're able to provide that support because we don't take good care of ourselves, then it's going to be very difficult for us to take care of someone else. So we talk a lot about sustainability. Is this something we can keep up short term? Is it something that is going to be a lot harder for us to do on a long term basis? So I always encourage families to try to work together on a plan. Um, this not only can help us try to prevent decision making when there's a crisis, um, but it also helps kind of, I think, give everybody a little bit of a plan in case something changes, that we have an idea of what we're gonna do. And so one thing I always encourage caregivers to do, and I think this can help a lot with managing, we talk a lot about anxiety or self-care, trying to make sure that we have a little bit of a plan. You know, I've heard from a lot of caregivers that say to me, you know, if something changes, I don't know what I'm gonna do. Well, let's try to go and think about what are some of the options, what could be things that we could do, even if our loved one maybe isn't necessarily in 100% agreement with that plan right now, that having an idea of does a service that I might need exist, if mom fell and needed um, rehab, where would I think for her to go, um, if we found we needed more supervision. What does that look like? Could they come live with me? Could I come live with them? What does all of that look like? Just to have an idea of something to pull from in the event that we need that plan. You know, I always say that when we're in the hospital at the bedside, when there's been a crisis and, you know, my, my social work colleagues will come to, you know, the patient and their family and say, the medical team is recommending subacute rehab you know, that you get a little bit of physical therapy, occupational therapy to get, you know, recover from this hospitalization or this injury or illness or whatever it may be. Um, where would you like to go? That's oftentimes the question because in that environment, it's a very fast paced decision, right? And so many times families will say, what is subacute rehab? I'm not even sure. I don't even know what that is. I don't know where to go. And there's, there's a very short window because in the hospital, everything moves very fast paced. So I encourage you to think about, okay, if something happened, my loved one needed rehab, where would I get that information? Where, what facilities might I even consider choosing from rather than trying to have a list and deciding in a very short period of time, right? A little bit of planning can help alleviate some of our own anxiety about this process. So oftentimes as caregivers, that there's a lot of emotional challenges. 
a lot of financial concerns, as well as physical challenges, right? If we're assisting another person with managing their household, um, or if we're caring for a spouse or a partner, and we're picking up more than what we maybe have done in the past, right? That's a lot for what person to, to take on, you know, in addition to juggling our other responsibilities in our life. Um, if we are physically providing hands-on care that, you know, we talk a lot about wanting to make sure we're doing that in a safe way so that we ourselves don't get hurt in the process, right? So that's physically some challenges, practically challenges, but there's also a significant emotional component to this because we're caring for someone that we love who is declining, who is having changes in their health. And, and that's a lot to process, right? Oftentimes as caregivers that we're really great at taking care of everybody else, not so hot at taking care of ourselves. And I, and I appreciate that Jessica mentioned about and emphasized about the importance of taking care of ourselves and seeing a healthcare provider. Because oftentimes as caregivers that, you know, I've had um, more than one person to say to me over the years that, you know, the idea of going and sitting in another doctor's waiting room, um, when that's all I do is I take my loved one to the doctor to go sit in another waiting room for myself. I just can't stand the thought of that. But there's a lot of ways that present when we talk about having high levels of stress and caregiving can cause stress. Having high levels of stress has a lot of hidden health effects Living with chronic stress and the constant state of anxiety can almost be a vicarious type of trauma that we have increased cardiovascular risk. We have increased, you know, um, concerns about things like anxiety or depression and left untreated that that can have some pretty negative health effects um, in addition to making us feel burned out right? Um, if we're really just overwhelmed and just completely burnt out that, you know, not only can that lead to some negative effects for ourselves, but also, you know, that may lead to some challenging dynamics between us and the person that we are caring for. Um, if you've ever felt stressed or overwhelmed, or, you know, you're just feeling a, a kind of, you know, the candles not only burning at both ends, but it's kind of burn down to, you know, the end and it's right there, you know, we get a little bit kind of cranky sometimes ourselves because we're feeling overwhelmed, we're feeling burnt out. And oftentimes we're kind of taking that out on the people around us. We don't necessarily intend to do that, but sometimes that's what happens. And if we're, in addition to providing, we're providing care for someone, we're a little bit short with them because we're overwhelmed, you know, and sometimes that then they're a little bit short with us. And that back and forth, you know, doesn't necessarily help the dynamic. It doesn't help the caregiving dynamic. And this is why we talk about the importance of making sure that we're asking and reaching out for help when we need it, because it's, a, it's very difficult to, do, to provide care for another person without some type of relief from time to time, because we need it. That's, that's the reality of, of, you know, taking on this responsibility, right? Is that we need a little bit of a break sometime. That's very human, that's very normal. And I've also said to caregivers too, that if you find it difficult to find that reason to take a little bit of a break, if nothing else, think about the fact that maybe your care recipient also needs a little bit of a break from you. You know, we're caring for families and I always see family has a wonderful way of just knowing exactly how to push each other's buttons. Um, so sometimes that, you know, we all need a little bit of a time out from one another and that's okay. And that's perfectly healthy and perfectly normal, right? So everybody can use a little bit of a break from time to time. That can be very beneficial, okay? So just some little um, statistics, just because I think this helps put a little bit of an eye on, you know, what we're seeing um, in terms of some of the, you know, dynamics and the change across the country. Um, we're seeing a growing number of people who are providing care for a loved one. Um, you know, over 50 million people provide care. Um, more and more people are caring for more than one person. Um, many caregivers say they have challenges in coordinating care. More and more people are caring for someone with Alzheimer's disease. And many caregivers are having increased reports of having poor health. So again, the data reflects a lot of what we're seeing. And I think this is where it's, it's important to not only understand that you're not alone in this, but also kind of having an understanding that more and more people are going to be impacted by this in the years to come. So what makes this challenging, right? We talked about some of the practical and emotional costs. 
Um, but when, when we're caring for someone who has long-term care needs, it also means that sometimes, you know, we're talking about, um, you know, how do we deal with this? How do we cope with what we're, what we're doing for, for our loved one? And this is where we talk about the, the term burden. Right. And burden sometimes has a, a negative um, connotation. And, you know, but I think that it's important to help reframe how we talk about feeling overwhelmed a little bit about times and how do we sort of break this down about what the challenge is and how do we manage that? Um, because and how do we find that balance? We first have to understand where things are unbalanced so we can better understand how we can sort of reset that where we can. So we talk about the idea of objective burden, right? This is the reality of the demands that we face as a caregiver. For example, objectively, if we are providing more care for our loved one and we are not able to hire a home health aide because there's a shortage of home health aides across New Jersey right now, um, and then maybe that means that you can't go back to work or you need to take more hours away from work or you had to retire early. That could be a disruption in your job, maybe some change in your income, right? If we are so stressed as a caregiver um, that, you know, we're running around like a crazy person, like I mentioned before, the woman who's, you know, she's running to her parents for an hour in the morning and driving then 45 minutes to go to work all day and then driving an hour back to her parents. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, <coughs> all the winter time is fun. Um, I'm so sorry. <clears throat> but, um, you know, we talk a little bit about some of these challenges. And the reality is these are the things that we can't change. They're objective facts about the reality of our role. But subjectively, this is what we talk about in terms of our feelings. <clears throat> I'm so sorry. I'm, I have bronchitis. So please forgive me a little bit. Um, but, you know, subjectively, this is how we feel about our role. Right? We might feel angry, we might feel guilty, we might feel lonely or sad or worry more. Right? This is sort of how we feel about the objective, um, practical things that we, we face on a regular basis. So when we add all of these elements together, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> that, you know, think about there's this wonderful screening kit that helps you kind of identify a little bit about you know, how you feel as a caregiver right now. Look at this little stoplight on the right-hand side. And as I read the following statements, think about your level of you feeling overwhelmed, right? Think about the number of the objective, practical things that might be challenging for you, but also your feelings about it, right? As a caregiver, do you feel that you, um, you know, when you think about your level of stress, do you nearly always or quite frequently feel stressed? <coughs> Do you sometimes feel stressed? Do you rarely feel stressed? Do you feel that you don't have any time for yourself? That you know that you don't know what to do about the person that you care for. You nearly always don't know what to do. You sometimes don't know what to do. Or you pretty feel pretty confident that you know what to do for the person that you're caring for. Right. If we find ourselves in the red severe burden area, oftentimes that this means that, you know, we need to find some type of intervention that's going to help us find a little bit of balance. Right. So using some different services that we're going to talk about tonight to help us find and readjust. Right. And find these resources that can help us alleviate some of the subjective burden. We may not be able to manage, you know, we may be able to provide some interventions for some of the objective burden, the task. Where can we make some changes there to help reduce some of that burden a little bit, but also how can we cope with some of the ways that we are feeling about it? Conversely, I've had people over the years that, you know, objectively, I'll give you an example, the woman that I mentioned that, you know, she's doing this extensive travel and, and everything. When I talked to her about it, you know, um, she really didn't feel as overwhelmed as I thought she might have felt because her feelings about what she was doing was that this is my family and this is what I want to do and, and what I need to do. And I'm just going to kind of keep going. Um, and so she, subjectively, she didn't feel that her burden was high, but objectively that there was a lot on the plate. 
Conversely, I've had, you know, caregivers in the past that objectively, when you look at the task that they were doing, that burden might have seemed quite small, but subjectively their feelings about it amplified that level of burden quite high, right? Especially in cases where people are caring for someone that, you know, may be a loved one, but it doesn't mean that we like them. You know, just because I often say, you know, caring for an aging loved one, you know, but sometimes that, you know, we don't always like the person that we love. We love them, they're our family member, but it, we have may have a difficult relationship with that person, okay? So other things that impact our experience as a caregiver is how far away that person lives from us. If it's more than an hour away, then oftentimes caregiving is difficult logistically, not only emotionally, but also this logistics part of it. Our role is not as much hands-on as it is about gathering information about resources, putting together those services, putting together a team to help meet the needs of our loved one. Um, it makes it difficult so that if something happens to our loved one, we're not able to always be there um, as quickly as we might like. And that's difficult emotionally when we feel we can't be there. You know, where our loved one lives, in addition to not only, you know, that long distance and how far apart we are, but where our loved one lives, or do they live in a more rural setting? You know, in rural, set, rural settings, there's fewer services oftentimes, and rural doesn't have to mean, you know, the middle of Iowa. Um, it could be, you know, parts of, you know, Sussex, Warren County, Central New Jersey, Southern New Jersey. You know, we have a very diverse state here. Um, and oftentimes the caregivers will find that it, if their loved one lives in that area, that there may not be as many services, things like home care um, is, is often a challenge in more rural areas, you know, um, you know, that there's some more practical challenges that come up. We also talk a lot about our cultural approaches to caregiving, you know, in many cultures, there's family expectations. And in many families, there's dynamics and expectations about um, the roles of spouses and adult children and how we care for a loved one. And this doesn't always match um, an individual's capabilities. Maybe there are other responsibilities or preferences about providing care. And so sometimes that's an additional part of this conversation is how do we negotiate between the expectations of our family or our culture in combination with our other preferences or responsibilities? And, you know, does that always match? And if it doesn't, how do we cope with some of the emotions that come up from that? As I said before, also to understanding our choice and the feelings that we have about being a caregiver. Sometimes caregivers are unexpectedly put in this role. Maybe they're the only family member who's nearby to provide care. Um, oftentimes what I found that caregivers who feel that they didn't have a choice in taking on these responsibilities, there's a lot more emotionally that comes up. They tend to also have um, some other challenges with, we talked about burden before, this particularly subjective burden, and may feel a lot more emotional distress um, about their caregiving role. They might have some increased guilt, feeling more depressed, maybe a little bit of anger, a little bit of resentment. So just kind of if someone is being, you know, a caregiver um, who is, you know, maybe the caregiver by by location um, and you know they're sort of the one who has stepped up to the to the plate so to speak that oftentimes that you know it's important that if we are struggling with some of those other emotional challenges that we're addressing it so again that we're making sure we can find a good healthy outlet to take good care of ourselves so some practical things that can be helpful to help us kind of find some balance you know we talk a lot about navigating challenging conversations. Um, if you find that you need to talk to your loved one about, you know, more difficult topics, things like getting some help at home, transitioning out of a home into a care setting, stopping driving, right? Um, if any of you've had, you know, the, the pleasure of having one of these challenging conversations, you know that they're incredibly difficult. Um, you know, they're sometimes a not only hard to start, but they're also hard to kind of know how to approach these conversations. 
So some general tips that can be helpful is to try to talk in a quiet place um, with everyone who should be involved in the conversation. We don't need to have everybody all at once necessarily like that. There was a show a number of years ago, I think it was called Intervention or something, you know, where you have like 20 people in a room and saying, this is why you shouldn't be doing this. You know, that can feel very overwhelming, but the key people who should be part of that conversation, that can be helpful to have them there in a quiet place. We don't need to go out to a diner where there's lots of loud ambient noises, um, you know, but have a talk in a quiet place. And it's sometimes it's helpful to have small kind of casual conversations to plant the seeds. You know, things like talking about stopping driving are usually a never one and done type of conversation. Um, it oftentimes that takes more casual conversations to build upon to have larger decision making conversations later. And you can also pull from a neutral event. Um, so maybe something in the news, maybe a recent incident to kind of get things going and, you know, kind of approach it from an open ended question. Um, you know, saying, you know, kind of framing from the context that, you know, I don't know how you feel about this. I'd like to kind of better understand how you feel about this. You know, maybe we've never talked about this. I don't want to kind of, you know, pry or make things, you know, kind of, you know, but it would give me some peace of mind to know that there might be a plan if we need one. What would be your preference? You know, I, I, um, I occasionally see patients in our geriatric medical practice in Morristown and one of the questions that I always see or um, ask our new patients is, in the event that you found that you needed some more help than you do right now, what would that look like for you? Would that mean bringing some help into your home? Would that mean wanting to look at a senior community? What would be your preference? And I've had many patients over the years who say, either I don't know, I haven't thought about it. And that's where I say, okay, that's, that's okay. But here are some of the options. You know, what do you think you might think? Here's some information that can help you, you know, in the event that something changes, because it's good that we have a plan in case we need it, you know, um, and to kind of initiate some of that conversation. Now, sometimes these conversations do need to happen and decisions do need need to be happening sooner rather than later. Um, but these can be good kind of springboards to start the conversation. And if we do need to make decisions, kind of putting a time frame, saying, you know what, we sort of need to make a decision about this. I want to help support you in that, but we need to make a decision about this, right? Because things are, especially when we start talking about safety concerns, that's usually when there's more urgency is when there's more safety concerns. So here are some other tips that can be helpful just in general, you know, um, again, how helping you as a caregiver, trying to help you find your balance and trying to kind of navigate this, this journey is that when you're talking to your loved ones, start with small steps towards change, right? Especially, um, you know, it, you know, if where we can, right, if we can make small steps at that time, you know, making big changes all at once is really overwhelming for all of us. As human beings, we don't change easily or without a lot of effort. Right. Um, so big changes are hard to implement and they're not realistic sometimes. Sometimes we have to because it's an urgent situation. We have to do something and we don't have a choice. But if we can make some of those small steps, try doing that first. So, for example, when talking about driving, if it's safe, maybe we could talk about limiting driving versus stopping completely. Right. If you need to have other professionals involved in that conversation to help you have that conversation, you know, then that's important right, to be able to, um, you know, have their support in helping you talk about these changes, such as your loved one's doctor or other healthcare providers. Um, I always also tell caregivers that listen to what your loved one is saying and listen for the feelings behind the words. Sometimes, um, you know, people will say something, but they don't actually mean that. Um, saying things like, I don't need help, may mean I'm really frustrated or I'm embarrassed that I need assistance with things that I used to be able to do. You know, um, I always tell folks to look for the why. If someone is being resistant to, you know, um, implementing some type of care, um, there's usually a reason for it. If we're talking about, you know, changes in memory and that, you know, there's a, you know, um, cognitive process happening, that's a little bit different. But oftentimes, you know, when we talk about, you know, trying to make some changes that if someone is resistant, there's usually an underlying reason for it. 
And it's helpful for us to try to pull out what that reason is. Is it fear? Is it anger? Is it frustration? Is it, um, you know, concerns about cost? You know, what's the underlying, you know, um, you know, reason? I always kind of say, find the why. And, and if we can sort of find the why, that helps us start to develop collaborative strategies to help implement change, right? The other piece of this is acknowledge loss. Um, I think sometimes that when we talk to someone about making significant changes, like moving out of a home, stopping or limiting driving, have experiencing changes in independence, you know, maybe grieving the loss of a spouse or friends, living with chronic health issues, having memory changes, all of these are losses. And they're incredibly difficult and incredibly frustrating and challenging to cope with. And most older adults are experiencing more than one of these at once. So acknowledge that. Um, you know, acknowledge that this is hard. You know, I, I often, I do a lot of education with our resident physicians and our, you know, our doctors that we talk a lot about. When we say that, you know, we're going to put a Foley catheter in, or you need to go to subacute rehab, you know, and acknowledge that that's hard. It's not, you know, it's something difficult. It's a big change. I know that this is going to be hard. Um, and I get that this is not what you probably were hoping for. And I understand that it's uncomfortable, but how can I help you through it? You know, um, I think sometimes that we have a tendency to minimize how difficult things can be. Um, you know, I, I often tell the story, and if you've heard me talk before, you may have heard the story, so forgive me. Um, but years ago, I, I managed an assisted living community, and I had my um, a woman who had planned to move into our community, she was going to be moving in. Her son had made that decision for her. Um, she was not entirely thrilled about that decision, um, as you can imagine, because he had made it totally without her input. And I always say that's a great way to get somebody on board with the decision is to make it for them. But anyway, um, he had decided she was going to be coming to our community and, um, the sales and marketing person was bringing her around to everybody's office to introduce her. And she came to my office and, you know, she looked about as, as thrilled as you can imagine. And then between the sales person and her son, they're like, mom, this is going to be great. It's gonna, just going to be like club med. Right. And for those of you who may not know what club med is, sometimes I date myself, but if you think of like all of one of those beautiful, all inclusive type of resorts, right. And she just turned around and looked at everybody and she said, what the heck kind of club med do you people go to? And I just looked at her, I said, I get it. Like this, this wasn't the plan. Um, in all of my years, I've been working with seniors and families for about 20 years in different settings. And I can tell you that in all of my years, I've yet to meet anyone that has ever said to me, my goal in life is I want to live in assisted living or a nursing home when I get older. That's just not what most people say is their plan. Um, and I looked at her, I said, I get it. It wasn't the plan, but how could we make the best of it? And I think that that's, you know, makes, you know, a, a big difference in trying to connect with people and our loved one and say, I understand this maybe wasn't what you wanted, but how can I work with you? How can I support you to help make the best of the situation? And this is where I say engage people in the, in the decision making process, however they can, you know, um, even if they're no longer the primary decision maker, you know, having them be part of the process allows their preferences to be supported and allows you know, a little bit of control and a little bit of dignity, right? It's maybe not saying we're not in the driver's seat, but, you know, um, you know, kind of like the, the silly metaphor that if, you know, we're, we're going to go have dinner, you know, the goal is we're going to have dinner, right? But you can pick the restaurant. We're going to a restaurant, you know, and, but where would you like to go? right? We're going to have dinner. Which of these would you like to go to? If that's too much of an overwhelming choice for someone, you know, say, would you like to go to, um, you know, this restaurant or that restaurant? You know, I call those guided choices. So even those who have, you know, more significant cognitive impairments or have difficulty with making decisions and feel overwhelmed, you know, offering guided choices can be helpful to help someone feel, still make them feel like they're part of a decision-making process. So as I said before, talking a little bit about resistance and sometimes we have challenging behaviors and challenging behaviors come from, you know, things like illness, um, maybe our personality, um, denial, um, maybe it's the family messenger. I often kind of say that the messenger 
and the message are equally important. Um, sometimes people will hear things from their doctor that their spouse or adult children have been saying for a long time, but because it was coming from the spouse and adult child, they weren't hearing it. Um, so sometimes it's who's saying what, you know, what the message is makes a big difference. All of these things play a role in someone's ability to accept change and assistance. You know, as I said, change is often very difficult. Um, oftentimes resistance and behaviors come from feeling less independent, being resentful of changing abilities, feeling the loss of control, being frustrated. Oftentimes as caregivers, um, you know, you're the ones that are getting the brunt of these feelings right? I always encourage to try to think about, you know, when those behaviors come up, try to find the why. Um, if you can try to look to find a trigger, did something happen? Is this an exacerbation of a lifelong issue or is it a behavior that's related to a progressive disease? You know, has dad always been anxious? And as he's gotten older, the anxiety has just escalated. Um, is, you know, your husband um, more paranoid or agitated because he has cognitive impairment? That's a disease that changes our perception of reality and impacts our judgment. So it could be related to the disease process right? Just some little quick kind of tips here on the side. Um, again, trying to isolate the cause, ruling out pain. Um, I always say focus on the feelings, not on the facts, especially if we have someone who um, is experiencing memory changes that oftentimes, you know, we don't kind of engage in, and kind of dig into the content when, you know, someone, you move my stuff, you know, you took all of my things or, you know, you're stealing from me, you know, you're probably not going to be able to rationalize with someone who has dementia to say, I didn't take your stuff. I didn't do that. You know, I, I hear that this must be really frustrated that you're, you know, I, rather than arguing about it, you know, focus on the feeling. I'm, I'm know this must be really frustrating that you can't find what you were looking for. Can I help you find it? You know, let's look together. Okay. Try not to get upset. This is probably the one thing I say that is the easiest thing to say and the hardest thing to do, right? Try not to get upset. Even if, you know, <laughs> one out of 10 times that we can try to catch ourselves and try not to get upset, that's improvement. So it's not gonna happen every time. We are imperfect human beings caring for another human being. Things sometimes, don't always work out the way that we wanted them to. But if we can try to go and implement things to try to do a little bit, you know, to de-escalate things a little bit can be very helpful. Even again, one time out of 10, that's some type of improvement. You know, try to, if there's a relaxing activity to shift things, um, you know, and if the person's safe and you, you know, you're safe, it's okay to walk away and take a break for a minute. As long as everybody is safe, you know, it's okay to step away for a minute when these behaviors distance happens. So this is probably one of the, the phrases that I hear most often um, from family caregivers in regards to, excuse me, a loved one who they would love to make um, different, cha different choices, but are more resistant. And this can actually, when we talk about this caregiver balance and trying to find that balance in our life um, and the idea of burden. I've had a lot of people that say to me that the burden is not actually providing care. It's trying to fight with them about convincing them to let me help them um, or to do things the way that would be safer, right? And so this phrase of if they would only, right? Unfortunately, we can't force loved ones to make better choices. Um, even when it might be in their own best interest. Um, and I'll talk about the difference. This is for individuals who have capacity, meaning they have the ability to make decisions. I'm gonna talk in a minute about individuals if we're caring for someone who does not have capacity because of cognitive changes or other um, issues that impact their ability to make those decisions. But if they have the capacity to make decisions, we can't force people to make a better choice. Even, you know, if that might mean that they might have a better outcome, we are all have the right to self-determination, their right to autonomy. Everyone has the right to make poor choices, as long as they're sort of able to understand the consequences of their actions or inactions. Um, you know, it's sort of this, this kind of thinking about this, if someone has diabetes, right, and they say, you know what, 
I'm not going to take my medicine. I'm going to eat a pint of haagen every night. And yeah, I know that my blood sugar can spike and I can have all of these negative consequences. I can have, you know, neuropathy. I can have changes in my vision. I can have all of these other negative consequences of not managing my diabetes. Yeah, I know it. I'm going to do it anyway. They have the right to, to, to make that poor choice. We would love for them to not make that choice, but everybody's got the right to make poor choices as long as we have the ability to do so, right? So oftentimes as a caregiver in these cases that we need to be able to set some healthy boundaries or limits on what we're able to assist someone with and stick with these boundaries. So for example, I've had many older adults over the years that say, I'm totally independent. And it actually comes out that they're independent because of the extensive assistance that their loved ones provide to them. And, you know, or they'll say, I don't want some additional help at home because they only want their adult child to do it for them. And, you know, I, then I see the adult child who is just totally overwhelmed and this is not a sustainable situation. And so we have to say, you know, um, we would love for this person to be able to do this in perpetuity, but that's not a sustainable situation. So we're you have to compromise a little bit here, and you know, as a caregiver, say I can't I can't come every day, all day. I could come three days a week, and the rest of the time that we need to have some additional help. But then the hard part about this is sticking with that boundary, right? Because again, if we're continually giving from our cup and giving until there's nothing left in the cup that we, you know, we're not going to be able to take care of ourselves. And that's not necessarily a sustainable situation, right? The other part of this is I always tell caregivers to pick your battles, right? Um, I had a, some, a woman I was working with a number of years ago that she was caring for her husband who had Alzheimer's disease. And she said, every morning we have a fight about getting dressed. You know, he doesn't want to get out of his pajamas. And, you know, this was a person who was always fastidiously up and dressed and ready for the day by seven o'clock in the morning. He doesn't want to get out of bed. He only wants to be in his pajamas all day. He wants to come to the breakfast table in pajamas. That was not part of his routine. And I'm trying to help him maintain some of what, and, and every morning was this big fight. And I said, you know, that may have been who your husband was his whole life, that that was something, but now with the context of dementia that, you know, it's hard. It's hard. He doesn't want to be out of pajamas right away. And you're setting yourself for yourself up for a really rough day ahead because we're starting with a fight every day. Is it imperative that he's in out of his pajamas and in a dress for the day for breakfast? You know, will anything be terribly wrong about that? No. Right. So we talked about that. No, it wouldn't necessarily be something wrong. It's just a deviation from the person that he'd been. And what we found is that when she stopped fighting about the pajamas and he was able to have breakfast, it kind of set it up. So after breakfast, it was a little bit easier to coax him into doing morning routine and, and it helps set a different tone for the day. So this is where I say, pick your battles, right? As long as everybody is safe, we're talking about everybody is healthy, right? It's okay. If the clothes don't match that day, if, you know, um, we haven't done things exactly perfectly. It's okay, right? Th don't sweat the small stuff, right? For the bigger concerns, sometimes you can help to enlist the help of professionals. Um, sometimes healthcare providers like the doctor can be very helpful. As I said before, the messenger and um, is just as important as the message. Um, as well as, you know, in addition to engaging a doctor, there's other professionals like private geriatric care managers. Those can also be helpful people to help intervene. Um, unfortunately, sometimes that does mean when we're setting healthy boundaries with someone who has the capacity to make decisions and they're just not making great ones. Um, unfortunately, sometimes as caregivers, that might mean we need to plan for the crisis. Um, so when things kind of blow up and we know that we know that if nothing changes and oftentimes I'll say to a family um, that we need more help. You know, our loved one is completely re is resistant to home care, doesn't want help, you know, says, I know, I understand, I don't want to make these changes, I'm not going to do it, I'm not going to accept the help, you know, and we're saying, but, you know, we're increased risk for a fall, we're going to get hurt, something bad's going to happen. 
And if we're totally resistant and they say they understand, they, they have capacity to make a decision, they're just refusing things, then as the caregiver, sometimes that means that we're planning for the crisis. We would love to avoid the crisis and we would love to help our loved one avoid that, that pain or that difficulty or that you know difficult period of their time and have a better outcome by implementing the service now, but they don't wanna do that. So we need to plan for the crisis. And what, that, what does that crisis look like? What services or resources might we need to engage when that happens? Um, I also do mention about adult protective services. This is the agency in every county across the country. There's an agency in every county um, to help address who are at risk of um, abuse, neglect, and um, self-neglect included in that. Um, and they investigate claims for anybody over the age of 18 that might be at risk for neglect, self-neglect, or exploitation, okay? Um, that's sort of our last line of defense, but um, oftentimes they can really only be helpful for when someone has lost capacity. Again, because we can't make someone make better choices who has the decision-making to be make better ones, right? So conversely, when someone has dementia or a cognitive um, process, um, and for those of you who um, may be caring for someone who has um, dementia or another um, disease, you know, a disease that causes dementia symptoms, I often describe dementia, think of it like um, an umbrella. Um, dementia describes a set of symptoms like memory loss, changes in personality, um, you know, changes in thinking, judgment, insight, all of those things. Those are all symptoms. There's different diseases that cause dementia symptoms. And it's important that if our loved one is experiencing them, these symptoms, that we are looking to better understand what disease is causing those symptoms. Alzheimer's disease is a type of, is a disease that causes dementia symptoms. It is the most common type, but there are others like vascular um, dementia, Lewy body dementia, there's a type of dementia associated with Parkinson's disease, frontal temporal lobe, lots of different types of dementia. As I said, Alzheimer's is the most common, but it's not the only disease. And it's helpful to us sometimes as caregivers if we can get a better understanding of which dementia, um, which disease is causing our loved one's dementia because it can help us kind of better understand what that trajectory and what that journey might look like. So if our loved one has dementia, it's very common for individuals who have these symptoms to you know, have some challenging behaviors, be very repetitive, maybe have a little bit of paranoia, be resistant to care, have some personality changes, maybe some inappropriate behaviors, agitation, aggression. You know, and one of the reasons for this is that um, dementia causes, you know, it's, it's the disease that is causing these symptoms is causing ongoing, essentially brain damage. Right, our per certain parts of the brain are becoming damaged. Um, and because of what's happening in the person's brain, it's impacting how they see and interact with the world around them. You know, so for the person who, um, you know, is a little bit more paranoid, one of the reasons for paranoia is because, you know, um, we talk a lot about, you know, this recall and how our, our brain is not processing new information correctly. For you and I, you know, um, think about, think of this like a file cabinet. Think of, you know, every day, like a file cabinet. We pull out a drawer every day, everything we all do every day goes in a drawer, right? What kind what we had for breakfast, how cold it was today, what kind of, you know, what activities we did today, you know, um, listening to this webinar tonight, everything we all do goes in the, filed away in the drawer. Our brain works well, it can encode that information and stores it away so that if we need to go and pull the drawer out at a new time and pull that information out, we can because our brain has been able to file it away for us. But for someone who has a disease causing dementia is that there's pull that drawer out and like there's cuts in the bottom of that drawer. That information went in and it went right through as if it never happened. So because their brain is not able to process or encode or learn new information, oftentimes they'll repeat questions. They'll ask things multiple times. You know, so if they've asked you for the 10th time today, what time are you picking me up to take me to the doctor, right? And you say on the 10th time you've had it, right? They've called you nine times before and you say, mom, I've told you this, I'm coming to get you at 10 o'clock. And now mom's all upset and she's like, why are you yelling at me? 
I didn't say anything. What's wrong? Because to her, she has no recollection that she called you nine times prior. All she knows is that now she's calling you for the first time and you're yelling at her. Right? So we might understand why someone might get upset with us. If someone's paranoid, right? I kind of use this, this silly kind of metaphor um, often that if, you know, I come home every day and I put my you know, purse on the table by the door. And in my mind that that's where it is because that's where I put it. It's every day I put my bag by the door um, on that table by the door. So when I go to, you know, but I have dementia and I brought my bag upstairs. I brought my purse upstairs, but because my brain hasn't processed that information and I don't remember doing that. When I go to look for it next, I expect it to be by the door because that's where I believe I last put it. And if it's not there, well, somebody must have moved it. So the only other person could possibly be my husband. So he's definitely the one that moved my purse, right? Because in my mind, I don't remember moving my purse. And so the only other one could have done it is him. We can understand why people might get a little bit more paranoid. So I always encourage family caregivers, if we're caring for someone with dementia, that you know, trying to correct or argue with someone with dementia is usually just going to get everybody upset right? It's not going to really help the situation. You know, um, I, again, focus on the feelings, not on the facts, right? If someone's saying you moved my stuff, I hear that must be really frustrating that things aren't where you live, where you expect it to be. Can I help you look for it? Can we look together? You know, um, these are some different techniques that can be helpful. You know, sometimes when someone's agitated or upset, um, maybe, you know, look for those signs of physical discomfort, look for environmental factors, um, look for challenges in communication. Maybe they didn't quite understand what you said, say it in a different way, you know, um, try to, you know, address the feeling. What is the concern? Are they anxious? Are they scared? Are they upset? Are they, you know, frustrated with you? Do they need a little bit of a timeout? What's happening? right? Oftentimes for someone who's caring for a loved one with dementia, I always encourage them to seek out um, educational resources that can help you learn how to care for a loved one who has dementia. Um, The Alzheimer's Association is a national organization that's appropriate for anyone caring for someone who has memory changes. Um, Alzheimer's New Jersey is a local group that they have lots of local, they're all virtual right now, but support groups, um, educational programs, both have great resources on their website. Um, the Alzheimer's Association number there is a 24 seven helpline. You can always call to speak to someone if you're feeling overwhelmed and just not quite sure what to do. Um, it helps a lot to kind of learn how we can adjust to be able to provide care. How do we navigate through those difficult conversations? How do we start planning for the future? How do we communicate? How do we manage behaviors? Um, All of those things can be incredibly, incredibly helpful to us as we navigate this journey. Um, The last piece is as we go over is I know we're almost out of out of our time, but I do want to talk a little bit about, you know, kind of that getting ready, because I think it also as we try to find balance and take good care of ourselves, that we're also figuring out a way to help ourselves and manage some of our own anxiety about this. So getting organized can be incredibly helpful. It can help with long term planning, as well as time searching for important information in a crisis, getting together a box, a file. Um, a, a, you know, a file cabinet drawer, an accordion file, whatever works for you. I have families that scan documents into the cloud, whatever works for you. Um, but gather this information, medical information, doctors, specialists, medications, pharmacies, um, medical history of the person, right? Healthcare documents like advanced directives, such as the living will and healthcare proxy, right? These are important documents to have on hand, copies of insurance cards, legal documents, financial accounts and locations. Again, sometimes I've had many, um, some older patients that say, you know, I, um, you know, I I really just am um, not sure that, you know, my loved one doesn't want to share their financial information with me. And I say, you know what, maybe we don't need to share dollars, right, right now. But you could say, you know what, in the event that we needed, you know, um, more help, do we have some resources to pay for care? And I'm going to talk about that in one minute. Um, Or should I start looking into some social service programs? You know, where are the accounts located? 
that can be incredibly helpful. Um, you know, I had, I tell the story and some of you may have heard this if you've heard me talk that um, I worked with a family a number of years ago that their mom um, unfortunately had developed Alzheimer's disease and they were in the process of applying for Medicaid. And in that Medicaid application process, they have to provide five years of financial statements. Um, and mom unfortunately had a really great habit of, um, Every time a new bank was opening, she would go put $50, $100, whatever it was, into the account to get the free beach towel, umbrella, toaster, whatever it was. Um, and then she'd give those items away as gifts. And um, she did this across, I think, three different states. And so they were having a really hard time trying to track down all of these accounts. They just had like stacks of checkbooks um, from banks that they weren't even sure the bank was still owned by that company anymore. Maybe it was a different bank. Again, where are the accounts located? That can be helpful, again, saving time. Um, pension information, deeds, license, laces, car titles, any identifying documents, um, long-term care insurance, life insurance, all of those things, right? Um, the other piece when we talk a little bit about long-term planning, and this is a whole separate conversation um, that I do talks about separately because this is more involved, but if we think about planning for the future and long-term planning, I always um, you know, say to family caregivers that when you're trying to think about what the long-term plan looks like, think of it like a triangle. It's balancing our loved one's needs, their preferences, and finances. What kind of care do they need? What might they need in the future? Where would they prefer that care take place, right? At home, in a care facility? And what are their finances? Um, you know, Medicare and Medicare supplement plans do not pay for long-term care. Um, almost all long-term care is paid for privately, um, that we need to exhaust our own personal resources before we might be eligible for social service programs to help us with costs. So again, does what we need and what we want match what we can afford? Right. So I always encourage families and my older adults to think about what's the contingency plan? Um, what's plan B? What's my first option? What's my second option? OK. So in, like I've said, you know, we talk about navigating this maze. Um, there's lots of different options. Um, you know, there's lots of different information about how do we navigate this and trying to come down when think about that triangle, um, you know, considering how much of, is realistically available provided by the social network, right? As caregivers, how much can we realistically provide? Is this enough support? Is this sustainable support? Um, you know, financial resources, what kind of resources do we have? You know, does this match everything that we might need? Okay. So as I said, that Medicare and supplemental plans do not pay for long-term care. Um, most all care is something we have to pay for out of pocket. Um, you know, Medicare may cover some home care services, um, such as help after a surgery or hospitalization. Um, you know, oftentimes this is the question I get. They say, I asked Medicare, and Medicare says they cover home care. So the kind of home care that Medicare covers is very short-term intermittent help after surgery or hospitalization um, or recovering from some type of illness. It um, is usually short-term. It must be ordered by a doctor. A patient has to meet certain very specific clinical criteria to be eligible for that service. And it is intermittent and short-term. Usually doesn't last more than a few weeks. Might be a nursing visit once or twice a week, maybe a home health aid a couple of times a week for an hour or two, um, you know, maybe um, a physical therapist a couple of times a week. It's not ongoing care. Ongoing care is something we call custodial care. That's the kind of care that can come every day and help with things like personal care, supervision, meal planning, meal preparation, man, helping someone to remind them to take their medications. Um, and that can be anything from, you know, um, 15, 20 hours a week through a living. And that kind of care, which is what most people utilize to stay at home um, with that type of support outside of their family is what we call custodial care. And that is privately paid um, unless we're eligible for some social service programs. Um, so some of the programs, if we have a long-term care insurance policy that covers those home-based services, 
um, you know, that can be helpful in paying for care, social service programs like Medicaid. Um, and if we're a veteran or the spouse, the widow of a veteran, there is something called the Veterans Aid and Attention and Attendance Pension Benefit that's a cash pension that can help offset the out-of-pocket cost of care. So the last piece that I want to wrap up with is um, support for you, right? And how do we, again, find some of this balance? Well, we've talked about some of the communication strategies and those tips and techniques, but the important, the important part is really to find your village, right? Connecting with other people that um, not only get it, uh, but also can provide you the support that you need and is incredibly helpful. Um, this can be informal support, like family members, friends, who are the people that you call, who is the one that you vent to. Um, maybe you have a wonderful faith community that supports you. There's also more formal types of supports, right? Caregiver support groups, respite care programs, which I'll talk about in a moment, educational programs like this, where there's lots of online resources or forums, right? The most key part of this is finding that support because we can't do this by ourselves. Um, it really can be helpful even to just connect with someone else who is on that journey, has a little bit of understanding about some of the emotional context. Um, sometimes you learn some great information from other people who have discovered a tip, a trick, a service, something that has been helpful. I've learned tons of stuff from caregivers who sort of found a service that I as a professional didn't know about because they sort of connected with another caregiver who learned about something. So, you know, it still can sometimes be a little bit of an underground network, um, but it can be incredibly, incredibly helpful to find other avenues of support. So I encourage you to think about who takes care of you, right? Oftentimes you're really, really wonderful at taking care of your loved one, but probably not as great as taking care of yourself. Even as caregivers, we need our own caregivers, right? Those who can lend a listening ear, a shoulder to lean on, a moment of a little bit of a respite, a little bit of a break, or to offer words of encouragement, right? And I love this quote by Audre Lorde that says, I've come to believe that caring for myself is not self-indulgent. Caring for myself is an act of survival. So who are your caregivers? Who are the people that help take care of you, right? Do you have someone to help take care of you? Do you have those people in, our, in your life? When we talk about stress, we've talked a little bit about this. Stress can be physical and emotional, financial concerns, time management, competing demands, mental health concerns, relationship issues. All of this can culminate into that feeling of burden. We talk a lot about accepting help. Oftentimes, you know, I think in, in society, when someone asks you, how are you? We're all sort of conditioned to respond, I'm fine. Are we always fine? Right? We're not always okay. And sometimes it's okay to say we're not okay. Sometimes it's okay that, to say that we need help. I love this quote says, you can do anything, but not everything, right? As caregivers, oftentimes what I've heard over the years from people is that, you know, they don't want to ask for help because they feel responsible to do everything themselves. They don't want to bother someone else. They feel guilty taking time off. You know, they're worried that someone else isn't going to do it right. Right. And probably the biggest one is they'll say, I don't know how to ask for help. But we know that if we wait, we're going to increase our risk of feeling overwhelmed and becoming exhausted to the point where our own health is failing. So I always encourage caregivers to make a list, right? Make a list of the ways the other people can help. Even assistance with small things can really help, help alleviate that sense of burden, right? Those practical, that objective burden right, can be very helpful. So this time of year, you know, maybe going and saying, hey, when it snows, is there someone out there that could help shovel my driveway or shovel the sidewalk for me, right? That would be really helpful. Um, you know, could someone take a run to the pharmacy for me and just pick up dad's meds? That would be really helpful, right? All of those little tasks that can be incredibly helpful. And oftentimes what I've found is when talking with caregivers that they have potential helpers in their life, but those potential helpers, they're not really sure how, how to help. And so sometimes they'll do things like that we do in society, like bring food, which food is wonderful, but it may not be exactly what you need. 
right? So what's helpful is to have a list of things you actually do need, the things that will be very helpful. You know, making sure that you get the right help at the right time in the right way, right? So share your wish list. You know, what does, what is gonna be helpful to you? Do you have things around the house? Sometimes, you know, we have extended family members who want to be able to help, but they don't feel comfortable with helping with personal care. So maybe they can help, you know, with yard work. Maybe they can help with shoveling the sidewalk. Maybe they can help with cleaning out that spare room that, you know, just no one ever seems to have time for, right? Maybe um, some care for you right? Maybe a gift certificate for massage or a manicure or the opportunity to spend a day doing anything else other than providing care, right? Maybe looking at some support during holidays or family events. I know that this has looked a little bit weird the last couple of years as we've tried to navigate holidays and COVID and all of the fun stuff, you know, but if we're looking for extra help during, you know, um, family events or holidays, you know, if we want to engage, I've had families in the past that have hired a home health aide um, to be available during an event um, or a, a holiday or a celebration so that they're sure that their loved one can have the help they need should they need it, but they too can also enjoy the celebration without worrying about is my loved one gonna need some, some help or is there something gonna you know, come up that during that event, right? Again, thinking about what's gonna be helpful for you. So we talk a little bit about respite care. So respite care, um, you know, and you know, the, the challenge is, is um, you know, respite care is really any type of short-term care that gives the caregiver a break. This could be utilizing home care. This could be going to an adult day program. This could even be in a short-term, in a facility placement. Um, and a respite care can be used to not only take a break for yourself, take some time for self-care. You know, I've had caregivers that say, I need to have surgery. I'm not gonna be able to provide the care that I normally would for mom because I need surgery. You know, um, what does that look like? Um, most formal respite care is something that is privately paid. You know, respite care could also mean, you know, you want to ask your family to, to step in, that's a break. But most formal respite care, um, such as using home care, adult day services, things like that is something that is privately paid for. Um, if we have limited financial resources, there are usually some state respite care programs or grants available for those who have limited resources. Um, if our care recipient is on Medicaid, um, you know, that there are some respite benefits under Medicaid. Um, and I'll just to, for anyone who might be um, confused, I've had many people that ask this question. So I always tell folks, Medicare and Medicaid, they sound different, they sound similar, but they are different things. I'll give you my little mnemonic. Medicare is like care, like health care care because that's our federal health insurance program, mostly for people over 65. Medicaid is like aid, like financial aid, because we have to financially qualify for services. Um, and it, it will provide some long-term care um, in at home or in facility settings. But again, we have to financially be eligible for that. Okay. So in our last piece of our conversation, um, I give you one of probably my favorite tools that I think it's helpful if you think about being on a journey, right? We're going to, we're on a little car or our bicycle down this, this journey. Um, and you think about a wheel, right? So think about if your car was making strange sound or your, it was pulling to the side, you'd stop and you'd fix it, right? You think, oh, I have a flat tire. But oftentimes as caregivers, we don't even stop to think about how we're going down the road on our own wheel of life. Um, sometimes our wheel is flat, right? It's wobbly, it's, it's not inflated. So the wheel of life represents eight different areas that are all really a component of our life. Our work, our spiritual life, our physical and emotional well-being how well we're taking care of ourselves, our financial situation, our relationships that we have, and yes, recreation and fun, because as human beings, we also need to have fun in our life. So think about for a moment your own wheel. How bumpy is your ride? Are you taking care of your own needs, including making time for yourself? Are you taking care of yourself physically? Do you have quiet time for reflection or spiritual needs? How are you dealing with your emotions associated with your caregiving responsibilities? 
Are you worried about your finances? Are you spending time with friends and family? So if you think that your wheel might be a little bit deflated in any of these areas, pick one area that's out of balance. Start with trying to set aside 15, 20 minutes, five minutes, whatever you can do every day to start improving that area. If you wanna improve your physical health, see if you can go for a little bit of a walk. We wanna be a little bit better connected with other people, try to spend some time with friends, even calling on the phone, having some social interaction. Maybe it means that we need, you know, we're having a lot of emotions. We're really coming at a crisis emotionally and we need to seek out a therapist, somebody to talk to. You know, maybe we are having some physical challenges. Maybe we need to hire some extra help or we need to look about what are those options to give you a little bit of a break. And once you begin aligning these different areas, regularly reassess and try to take some small steps to help balance your wheel and continue to do this as you go along your journey, right? It's a great um, sort of technique that can be very helpful that if you just kind of take stock about how your wheel is rolling down on this journey is that 15, 20 minutes, small changes can have a really, really big impact. So as we wrap up, um, you know, I, I always encourage caregivers to, you know, there's no right or wrong way to do this, right? Human beings and caregivers, we're not, we don't come with instruction manuals. Um, if we're ever feeling that what we're doing is, is just not enough, remember to give yourself credit for this incredible role that you play for your loved one. You know, imagine what their world would look like without you, even for a moment, right? And use this as an incentive to take good care of yourselves. I love this quote from Jennifer Loudon that says, self-care is not selfish or self-indulgent. We cannot nurture others from a dry well. We need to take care of our own needs first, and then we can give from our surplus or our abundance. So I know we see some questions coming in, but I wanna give you some resources and some information um, and then um, continue to throw some questions in and I'll address them. So here are some resources and places to start. Um, and I'm happy to send these slides to Jessica to send out to anyone who would want some information. I don't expect you to write all these things down, but I'm happy to, to send out the slides so you have this information for you. Um, these are some great national places to start. Um, locally here in New Jersey, there's some great information and great places to start for, for some additional help and information. There's also through the United Way here locally in Northern New Jersey, there's the Caregiver Coalition. Um, they have some wonder, their coalitions, they have five, and they've won in Morris, Somerset, Sussex, Suburban Essex, and Warren. Um, and they are doing a lot of virtual programming right now, but they're, what I love about this coalition is that um, they do lots of great programs and events for caregivers and they're for caregivers across the lifespan. So it doesn't matter who you're caring for, if you're identifying as a caregiver, whether you're caring for someone who's aging, living with chronic health issues, mental health issues, an adult, a child, whoever it is that you're caring for, it's a coalition to help provide support for you as a caregiver. I'll give you my, my two minute elevator speech about who I am, if I can be a resource for you as well as some of the services um, within Atlantic. Um, that, so as Jessica mentioned, I run our health aging program, which is a free hotline. People can call and ask questions about anything related to caregiver services, older adult services, you name it. You get me, I'm the hotline. When I'm not um, in the office, there's, I have a colleague, Victoria, she's another social worker. She works in our geriatric assessment center practice. So you get one of us um, that we're here. We're both geriatric social workers um, that if you have questions about resources, you can you know, give, give us a shout and give me a shout to talk about what some of those options and resources could be. Um, for those of you who might might be more local. We do have our geriatric assessment center, which is an outpatient doctor's office located in Morristown that um, provides consultative evaluation as well as primary care for individuals over 65. Um, for new patients of that practice, the first visit's about a 90 minute visit. You meet with the physician to go over medications, medical history, any functional or cognitive changes, as well as with um, my colleague Victoria or myself, if she's off, we cross cover um, as social workers to to kind of review any services that could be helpful both now and in the future and talking about long-term planning. And 
If you found tonight's session helpful, um, we have a much more expanded series talking about the art of caregiving um, that we run for free. It's a virtual series. It actually starts Thursday. So if you're interested in that, um, we meet for five Thursdays. You could join us for any one of the sessions, um, you know, whatever is most helpful for you. Um, our interdisciplinary team teaches this series. Um, again, it's a free virtual series. We meet just through, uh, through Zoom, just like we are tonight. Um, session one, we talk a lot about some of the navigating of the maze of services. Um, session two, I have an elder law attorney that talks about legal and financial concerns. Um, session three, we talk a little bit about self-care and caregiver support and expand on some of what we've talked about tonight. Um, session four, I have a physician, um, a geriatrician, um, who actually talks about understanding normal aging um, versus diseases, disease processes, how you as a caregiver can talk with healthcare providers. And I have two of our geriatric nurse practitioners that talk a lot about the basics of hands-on care. Um, and then our final session, I have a um, clinical nurse ethicist that she talks about how we navigate the end of life journey um, and, um, you know, um, walking each other home. Um, at that phase in the journey. So you can scan the code here on the right that brings you to the registration page. Or like I said, I'll be happy to send this to Jessica to send it out um, to anyone who would be interested in this. For those of you who may also find it helpful, um, you know, if you're providing hands-on care for your loved one, um, we have our caregiver training lab that is located in Morristown. Um, it is a model home environment. You see in the picture, that's Jerry. Um, we built Jerry an apartment um, to help train family caregivers on how to provide hands-on care for their aging loved one. Um, it's set up with a model home environment, a model bath, kitchen, bedroom, um, some common assistive equipment and environmental adaptations that can help improve independence and home safety. Um, for $50 for a one hour training session, you can meet with myself as a social worker and a home health aide to um, learn some actual hands-on techniques. We, with Jerry, will teach you how to do transfers, um, tell me about your loved one, and we'll customize that training session to really help you learn um, the best way to provide hands-on care, whether that's personal care, um, you know, getting in and out of the shower, toileting, bathing, um, you know, care in the bed, whatever that might be helpful. Um, we do customize those training sessions. If you're interested in making an appointment for one of those sessions, you just got to call me. Okay. Um, I also mentioned our Atlantic Visiting Nurse and our Atlantic Adult Day Center, which is our social adult day program located in Basking Ridge. Um, you know, Atlantic Visiting Nurse, is our visiting nurse agency that provides Medicare covered home care services and hospice services throughout the region. And then the day program um, is the day center located down in Basking Ridge. And it's a wonderful um, day program for individuals who um, might have some underlying cognitive issues that might need a little bit of socialization and interaction throughout the day, um, but still be able to return home in the evening. And so with that, that's my contact information and I will pop over to the Q&A here, um, you know, but, um, and see if I can um, answer. So someone asked about the getting organized page. Um, yes, I can send a copy um, to the email. Is that okay, Jessica? I'll send yeah. you the slides. Yeah. And we can get that out. All right. Um, and yes, I will send you the resources via email. Um, yeah, we'll send the slides and everything out. Um, so asking was, uh, someone else is asking about Parkinson's disease. I'm sorry, about respite care and Parkinson's disease. So um, all respite care is something that, as I said, is something privately paid. Um, it is a service that um, can be provided, whether it's hiring a home health aid, whether they're going to a, a day program, whether it is um, going to... Um, you know, um, a, a facility for a short period of time to give the caregiver a break. Um, right now, I'll be very honest with you, um, it, is, it is a challenging landscape in healthcare right now. Um, there is a statewide shortage of home health aides. Um, so finding a home health aid might be a little bit more challenging right now. Most of the agencies that provide that custodial care um, uh, in this in northern New Jersey, the average cost right now is between 30 and $35 an hour. 
Um, most agencies require a 25 to 30 hour a week commitment right now. Um, just to kind of give you a ballpark idea, the prices and the minimum requirement have gone up. And a lot of that is because of the statewide shortage. Um, in um, a lot of the care facilities, you know, they're also being impacted by staffing. It's, it's sort of everywhere, unfortunately. And I do know that for um, someone's asking a little about going into respite care and COVID in a facility setting. Um, that there are isolation precautions, um, there are, you know, um, you know, testing requirements to do respite care in facilities, um, you know, sometimes that, you know, that they do have to stay in their room for a period of time, you know, but again, it, it really depends upon what's going to be helpful or what's going to be work and not every solution works for every person. Like I said before, there's no sort of correct formula for everyone in this elder care maze. Um, you know, um, so that's, that would be one part. Let me just, I don't know, Jessica, if there's anything else that you're seeing on your end. No, I think a lot of, a lot of it is uh, thank yous and uh, <coughs> that's, People wish that they could just take you with them everywhere so that they could ask questions. Um, but the good news is, is that uh, Rebecca's contact information is on this slide and you can call. Um, Rebecca, you are a wealth of information. And I know um, that usually there, you, you can find the answer. If you don't know the answer, you typically do uh, can find it. We'll do um, our very best. Yes, we do our very best. Um, so for some of you who might have some much more personal um, and tailored needs um, and questions around some of your own personal navigations as a caregiver, um, you can reach out um, to kind of do some one-on-one -on -one and get some, some of those resources. But um, I am happy um, to share, I will email out these slides. Um, Rebecca, if you would send them to me, I will send them out in PDF form so that you guys have them so you can refer back. Um, you can see some of the um, numbers. <laughs> and if you're interested in signing up for the, um, the caregiver class or any of the other services, um, all that information will be included there. Um, and for those of you who may have jumped on um, after we had already started, um, again, you are muted, so if you're looking to ask a question, you can type it into the Q&A um, or the chat. Um, I know I think we may have gone a, a little over. I went um, a little over, I'm sorry. It's okay. <laughs> um, but again, I see another thank you coming in. So, And again, thank you guys for joining us. I know it, it is hard as when we're caregiving that it to get that moment away to even do something like this can sometimes be a challenge. Yes, please feel free to reach out to me anytime. Um, as I mentioned, if the, the series we go into a lot more detail um, across five um, different sessions on different topics. So if you're interested in that, you'd like to participate in that live series, please, please join us. Okay. Yes, and if you have anyone has specific something questions, feel free to give me a call, send me an email. I'm happy to talk about your personal specifics. Mm -hmm. All right. So I think with that, we will uh, conclude the webinar. Thank you for joining us and a special thank you to Rebecca for um, dedicating your time and expertise to um, this evening. Um, if you have any additional questions, um, Again, you can reach out either to Rebecca or you can reach out to us at um, communityhealth at atlantichealth.org or you can call um, our main number 1-844-472-8499. Um, thank you and have a wonderful night, everyone. Take care. Right, take care. Good night.